Hello, welcome to the 68th episode of What the Wealth. I'm your host, Jonathan Bedner, certified financial planner, co-owner of Paradigm Wealth Partners. Today, we have guest and financial planner in the Paradigm Wealth Partners team, Katie Kavarad, joining us. Um, and some of you have met her around the office, if you're already clients. Um, she's been with us since March, but this is the first time she's been on the podcast. So I thought this would be a great way to have her just kind of come on and talk a little bit more about herself, what her role is at Paradigm Wealth Partners. Um, she's got a couple of tidbits to share, and then um, we're going to talk about kind of what's going on in the market and the economy right now. So with that said, Katie, thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Um, so Jonathan said, um, Katie Kavarad, I joined the Paradigm team back in March, and then uh, my family is actually from the Pacific Northwest, and we moved out here in May and um, joined the team here in Knoxville. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, a little bit about me. I am a wife and a mom. I've got two young kids, three and five, and um, I previously worked for another RIA back in the Portland, Oregon area. And as Jonathan said, I've come on to work with our clients specifically to build out financial plans and just help clients as they're thinking about retirement and their long-term goals to give them some peace of mind and a roadmap to uh, achieving those goals. So I'm really excited to be here and have very much enjoyed our time so far here in Knoxville, meeting all of our clients and just getting to know um, the, the folks that we get to serve out here in East Tennessee. Awesome. Let's, I have a question. This is totally what we did not talk about before we started this, but okay. if you were talking to people that were here and planning to go visit Oregon or the Pacific Northwest, what is one thing that is a can't miss? Like you have to do it. Oh man. I personally, I love the Oregon coast. It is about an hour, a little over an hour from the Portland area. And so my family went to the coast all the time just because it was an easy day trip getaway. Um, I really love it. Portland's kind of unique because it's close to the ocean. It's also close to the mountains. So there's just a lot that you can, if you're an outdoorsy person, there's a lot that you can go do and see. Um, lots of beautiful hiking areas as well, waterfalls, lots of good things like that. But I'd say my favorite is the Oregon coast. What is not counting family? Cause you saw a family back there, not counting family. What's the thing you miss the most? Like, is it a is it a restaurant that you used to like? Is it, you know, a certain park that you took the kids to? Like, is there something that you miss the most about being there? In terms of like a destination, um, you know, I mean, obviously it's family and friends, <laughs> the yeah. community that we had there. But apart from that, um, there's some really great destinations in downtown Portland. Powell's Bookstore is like one that's really well known. That we used to love going to really pre-kids. <laughs> it's just a beautiful, huge bookstore and folks that are, if you're going to visit Portland, it's a great spot to hit. Cool. Well, look it up. Maybe we'll get the books that I wrote over there. Oh, <laughs> yeah, get them on the shelves at Powell's. <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. That's, that's really cool. Um, we're obviously glad you're here. You've been a tremendous help for us and our clients and um, an awesome team member. And so I think we're very lucky to have you. So thanks for moving to port from Portland to here and joining the team. Yeah. Um, so I know you've been, you know, part of what you do as the financial planner is also trying to keep up with things that change and how that may impact your know, clients and their, not only necessarily their portfolios, but really like their lives from a financial planning perspective. So uh, I know that you found two tidbits, um, and I thought this would be a great place for you to kind of share two pretty important things that have, one happened, one about to happen, so I won't steal your thunder. What What's going mm -hmm. on that is going to be beneficial for retirees? Yeah, so some positive updates. I feel like we could all use a little good news. Um, the first of the updates is that on September 27th, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services released the 2023 standard monthly premiums for Medicare Part B 
and it will be $164.90 per month. And that is a decrease from the 2022 premiums. Um, now that doesn't factor in any IRMA surcharges if that applies to you, but still it's a decrease from last year. And as well, the annual deductible for Medicare Part B beneficiaries has been set to $226 for 2023, which is also a decrease from 2022's deductible. So some good news there. Um, and then the other update that we had is that, as you all probably know, the Social Security Administration announces a cost of living adjustment known as the COLA for the following year. And last year, the increase was 5.9%. This next increase will officially be announced on October 13th, so that's next week, um, but many are projecting that it will be somewhere between 8 and 9% this year. Either way, it could be the largest Social Security COLA since 1981, so really good news if you're already receiving Social Security, you'll get a nice, it looks like a nice increase um, for this next year, so some, some good updates there. Yeah, and I think a lot of people in the past have thought... And this is, you know, the last five, 10 years, the cost of living adjustment for Social Security is based on inflation. And so when inflation was historically low, the cost of living adjustment was trepid. Yeah. I mean, it's like 2% or, you know, there's a couple of years where there's zero. And mm -hmm. so it people got the cost of living adjustment, but the Medicare premiums, Part B, were going up too. And so it's like, you didn't really feel anything. A lot of times you might've gotten less because Part B went up even more than that. So I think the takeaway here is that if you're on Social Security or about to be on Social Security, then you're you're actually going to feel probably a 9% plus or minus real increase. Now, Medicare Part D and supplemental and some of that is probably going to increase too. But just the Part B that comes out of Medicare um, is going down, not by much, but it is going down some and you're getting a pretty big increase on the Social Security. So you should feel plus or minus a 9% increase. And once this official number actually comes out, these are the projected numbers Katie shared with you for the COLA, the Medicare that she, she provided is actually already announced. That took place in September, as she said. So that is announced. Once we get the official Social Security COLA cost of living adjustment, you know, we'll make sure to share that too. But, you know, here we are really, really close and I think we're we're projecting 8.7%. So that's awesome news. And I, I know that'll help a lot of people as inflation, you know, is higher. I think the one bad thing about that is it doesn't start till January, but um, you know, at least at least there's there's time and and know that it's coming. So so that's good. Um the next thing we want to talk about was just kind of where we are in the market and the economy. <clears throat> you know, we recently did a webinar on on some of the market and economy update, but we also talked about fixed income, which we're not going to go into on, on this podcast. But I do think it's important to talk about just kind of where we are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, if you're listening to the podcast, you won't be able to see the screen. You will be able to uh, see this on, uh, I don't know if we're going to put this on the Paradigm Wealth Partners YouTube or the What the Wealth YouTube, probably the What the Wealth YouTube um, channel. So if you haven't already subscribed to that, go to what the uh, go to youtube.com, type in what the wealth, Jonathan Bedner, and subscribe. And then you'll probably see you know, a video of this podcast pop up over the next couple of weeks, and you'll be able to see the chart we're going to share. But <clears throat> we're going to talk through this chart. So even if you're listening, you're going to be able to, to really kind of follow and understand exactly what we're, we're discussing. Um, and, and Katie's going to provide some snippets and some some information on the chart specifically and then i'm going to kind of talk about wh where we came from where we are now um and just kind of add some perspective so with that said i'm going to share my screen real quick and let katie start um you know kind of talking about where we are all right so this chart if you're seeing it here is from ben carlson's blog a wealth of common sense and we just felt like it does a good job of capturing real historical data around market returns during recessionary periods. 
If you've turned on the news at all in the past several months or even six months, we just keep hearing talks of recession and a lot of doom and gloom. And so we felt like this would be a good time to show real data and back that up and show kind of how the market performs around a time of recession. So if you can see the chart here, it shows market returns based on the S&P 500 at different time periods around a recession. So it starts with six months prior, then performance during the recession, then one, three, and five, and 10 years out post-recession. And we wanted to show this because really it, it, it takes us from kind of this place of anxiety and worry when we hear the word recession and all this fear. And it shows us really that this is a unique time of opportunity for the long-term goal-focused investor. If we look at the one-year post-recession returns of the S&P 500, you can see that in every year, with the exception of 2001, we've had positive returns and pretty large returns at that. And then if you follow that and you look out at the three-year, the five-year, and the 10-year post-recessionary returns, um, you can see that performance there. So what it really represents is this opportunity to be to be consistent and disciplined and stay the course and there's going to be some positive returns. Jonathan, what would you add to that? Yeah, you know, the market historically is a is a leading indicator. So it it knows somehow in advance of what's going to happen. And some of it's through, you know, just kind of paying attention to what's going on. You know, right now it's being driven by the Fed and inflation. And there's some concern about, you know, the war in Ukraine. There's some, some concern about, you know, uh, midterms. I think midterms is really a divisive. Um, you're either for or against the party that's in office or you're for or against the, you know, the, the party that's running. And the reality is usually after the midterms, you start to see the market rally, but it's not so much about who gets elected. It's more about... Um, just having that event behind us. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, it, it does pr provide or create, not provide, but create a little bit of noise on the front end. And so we just have a lot of things going on as we've talked about over the last, you know, several podcasts and, and really throughout the year, if I've had conversations with you about, you know, kind of all the things that are going on. Um, but the main driver right now is inflation and the Federal Reserve raising rates to fight inflation. And ultimately what they're trying to do is combat from what happened in the 1970s. And that was really, really high inflation where you might have, you know, earned 15% at the bank on a CD, but inflation might have been 13 or 14%. So you didn't realize any real, uh, any real growth. Um, it, it feels like it. But if you actually break the numbers down, you know, everything was more expensive then. And so what happened was, you know, as we moved into the 1980s, the Fed or Paul Volcker, not the Fed, but Paul Volcker, you know, really tried to beat that inflation. So he raised uh, Federal Reserve rates very, very high, very, very swiftly to knock down inflation. And that really kicked off kind of the 40-year bull market we've had since the 1980s. Now, we've had a couple of crashes. You know, we had the we had 1987 where the market crashed 25% in one day. Uh, they call that Black Monday, I think is what it was called. Um, we had uh, a couple of events in the 90s. Most notably was, you know, kind of the end of the 90s and early 2000s was the dot-com bubble bust. We had the 2007 and 2008 financial crisis. We've had the pandemic. Uh, and then we currently have the current uh, market correction. So we have all this, you know, major declines multiple times. But if we really look at that 40-year period, the market has actually been up substantially, even when you count those downturns. And so what I think this highlights is, and if you're watching this, you know, out of these 12 periods, uh, six months prior to the recession, six are positive and six are negative. So it's hard to know, like, to time, what's the best thing to do? When we look at the returns during a recession, six are positive and six are negative. And so 
with the with the most negative one being 35 percent uh during the recession of 2007 to 2009 the great financial crisis everyone thought that the global monetary system the banks everything was going to just straight up collapse and so we had really economic system was turned upside down until it wasn't um and some of that came with you know the fed cutting rates to zero uh you know using some sort of quantitative easing multiple rounds of quantitative easing um, which is financial jargon for just saying being very loose on the monetary supply or monetary policy to mm. spur economic growth. But one year later from the recession, and at this point, we're not technically in a recession. It hasn't been officially announced. Um, whether we are or we're not, it certainly feels like one. Um, mm. The returns of the market make it feel like one. Um, and at this point, we're nine months into this thing, and most recessions, bear markets last somewhere between, you know, 12 and 18 months. So my guess, and this is purely a guess, is, you know, we're halfway halfway done with things. This may be better. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly wouldn't expect this to fall another 25%. I guess it's possible. But usually what happens is we start getting very oversold, and people start saying, I don't think X, Y, Z company goes to zero and we're going to start buying. And I'll give you a stat on that here in a minute. But if we look one year out, like, like you said, 11 out of the most recent 12 recessions, and this is going back to, you know, the end of the 1940s. So we're talking about 60, 70, 80 years here. 11 of the 12 returns one year later were positive. To me, that provides a lot of optimism. You know, if I'm looking at from where we are today, one year out, not guaranteed, but reasons to give me, you know, hope. Yep. I think the bigger number here is um, is this 10-year figure. When you go out and look at 10 years, and, and, and what we advocate here is to be long-term equity investors. We think that's what helps people you know, meet their retirement objectives and dreams. And so when you are in this for the long term, you own good quality companies. Um, and you don't just view this as stocks on a piece of paper, which is your statement, but actual companies that we all use every day. And we believe um, are companies that innovate and, and, and drive to make change and connect us and make our lives better. We think 10 years from now, this is you know, great, great, great opportunity. Um, and when you start looking at 10 years out from some of this, most of the returns, you know, are, are 100, 200, 300, 400% higher. That's huge yeah. um, for people's long-term, uh, you know, outlook. And what people don't realize is a husband and wife today married in their 60s, odds are, I think, I don't have the exact number, but I want to say the odds are like 80 or 90 percent that one of you will live into your 90s. So it's very important that we get this long term growth of, of the market and, and take advantage of that, because if we don't, then we run the risk of running out of money. And, and that's what really you know hurts. So. Um, again, if you, if you don't see this, it will be on the YouTube channel so you can see this chart because i think it's very powerful it's a great way to keep us grounded to you know kind of where we are but you know what the long-term outlook is you have anything to add to that katie yeah i mean i think you did a good job of explaining that i think you know the bottom line is that the probability of a recession has likely already been priced in across asset classes and i know as you've mentioned before on the podcast markets tend to be forward-looking and can even start to recover as economic and earnings measures are still declining. So I think all in all, this should give us some optimism, some hope, some encouragement. Um, it kind of offsets all of the negativity that we've heard in the news. And as you said, it really just represents a great opportunity for the long-term investor to be you know, disciplined, stay the course, and look forward to these longer-term returns. I think one of the things that you mentioned about, you know, being disciplined and, and staying the course, I think we're seeing our, these, these companies do that themselves. 
we're seeing share buybacks uh, at the end of June 2022. So this news is now, you know, three or four months old, but it topped $1 trillion in share buybacks. So they're taking excess cash flow that they have. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, my stock's down 25, 30, 40%. We're just going to buy some of our own stock. And yeah. what that does for, for us that are owning shares is it makes our shares more valuable. Um, and it does so by, you know, if they're buying their shares, they're reducing the amount of shares that are outstanding for people to buy. And it makes their earning power or their earnings on their future shares that are still out there um, be higher and look better. And that really just drives share prices up over the long term. So um, while I think this is an opportunity for people to buy uh, and invest, you're also seeing the companies do the same thing and say, yeah, there's no reason my stock's down here. Um, we can't control the Fed, the inflation, any of this stuff. But, you know, I'm, I'm confident people are going to continue to drink Coke and Pepsi. And that's not an endorsement for Coke or Pepsi. But what you <laughs> see is companies say, you know, we're cheap. Let's buy. Um, and so I think that's actually a positive. So, uh, and one of the other things I think could be done is, you know, if you're not dividend reinvesting, do the same thing. Turn your dividend reinvesting on and let the sh the, the dividends that are paid out by these companies buy more shares when they're down. That does two things. It increases your uh, your dividends in the future because now you've got a higher dividend on more shares. And number two, when the market does rebound up or the shares do rebound back up, you had more shares at a cheaper dollar price. So you actually experienced some of that upside uh, as well. So I think those are two additional tidbits that I would add. But overall, you know, we are we are optimistic about where we are, you know, one, three, five, 10 years out. Um, the longer we go out, the more optimistic we are. But when I just look at history and, you know, history is not a guarantee. I want to make sure I say that. Um, and, and we're not making investment decisions looking in the rearview mirror. We're making investment decisions looking forward through the windshield. And when I look one year down the road, according to this chart that goes back to November 1948, when you see 11 of the 12 positive, I think it gives you room to say, we can be hopeful. Mm -hmm. Yep. So... That's what we have on today's podcast. It's kind of short and sweet. We want to make sure that we step in with some good news um, that Katie had found on cost of living for Social Security and the Medicare Part B premium going down. Wanted to make sure we had a chance. Katie's already met many people in the office. Um, she's already done a lot of financial planning work for clients. If you need help or want um, some financial planning or you want a second opinion, reach out to us. Um, and we'd be happy to to have a conversation with you and build out a financial plan for you and, and just make sure that, you know, you have a sound strategy on paper, on purpose for your life. And then again, we also want to kind of provide just kind of where we are, what got us to where we are and where we think we're going uh, in the future. So thank you all for joining us on this podcast. If you haven't already subscribed, subscribe. Um, and then if you haven't already subscribed to the YouTube channels, there are two of them, Paradigm Wealth Partners and What the Wealth, Jonathan Bedner. Thank you all for listening. Have a great weekend. Be confident in your retirement.